Amen. Thank you, Dr. James. Minister of Agriculture, the Honorable Alexis Jeffers, colleague Permanent Secretaries from the Nevis Island Administration, Permanent Secretary Ron Collins from the Ministry of Agriculture on St. Kitts and his delegation, heads of departments, including Directors of Agriculture, Mr. Randy Elliott of the Nevis Island Administration, and Mr. Melvin James of the Department of Agriculture on St. Kitts. Invited guests, I want to recognize Mr. Lu and his delegation from the Republic of China, Taiwan, Mr. Fleming from Cardi, and all other dignitaries and representatives here this morning. Early in 2020, we had what we've um, we, what we've had over the last three years is called Agenda 2020, where at the start of each year, we outline the plans and programs for the Department and Ministry of Agriculture. Having undertaken that exercise, one of the things that we've realized, we had some efficiencies and inefficiencies. We had certain things we were good at, certain things we were not so good at. It is responsible, it is responsible administration that is, that we take corrective action where we can. One of the strategies employed was to engage Mr. Augustine Merchant, who is revered as being one of the better directors of agriculture of the Nevis Island Administration in the history of the Department of Agriculture. After consultation with the minister, I also consulted with the Permanent Secretary of Human Resources. We got the go-ahead to engage Mr. Merchant. And today's activity is a direct result of his engagement with our ministry and department. The event today really is to be able to have you, our stakeholders, have a look at what we would have accomplished over the last three months and what we are looking forward to in the next three months. If you're a fan of basketball, you know the fourth quarter is always that most important quarter. So we're getting ready for that, that fourth quarter. And I want to just give, and we want to be able to give the different divisions a chance to present to you, our stakeholders, what they did over the last three months and what they intend to do over the next three months. Without any further ado, I would like to invite the Minister of Agriculture, the Honorable Alexis Jeffers, to deliver some brief remarks. <laughs> These are really different times that we are in. Uh, good morning, everyone. I want to start by acknowledging, I know the protocol was established by the Permanent Secretary, uh, Mr. Huey Sargent, but I, I want to pay respect to all who are here this morning at this most important event. So I want to start by acknowledging the presence of uh, Permanent Secretary at, at the federal level in the Ministry and Department of Agriculture, Mr. Ron Dublin Collins. I also want to acknowledge my Permanent Secretary here on the island of Nevis, uh, Mr. Huey Sargent. Uh, of course, we have uh, directors who are with us from both the local and federal level. I also want to uh, acknowledge our friends from the Republic of China Taiwan Technical Mission who are always with us, Assistant Secretary Russell Jeffers. And also, uh, I want to, at this point, recognize for sure the name that was mentioned earlier by P.S. Sargent, and that is uh, Mr. Augustine Merchant. Uh, he's perhaps one of the most important person among us today. I also want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Kristen Fleming of Cardi, of course, other permanent secretaries who are with us, uh, members, staff, supervisors from the uh, Department of Agriculture, both here on Nevis and on St. Kitts. I say welcome. 
Uh, this morning's event is uh, an important one, one that hasn't been held for some time, I believe. I would want to say it warms my heart to see so many of you here this morning uh, because this effort is one that um, has been long in the making. Uh, but of course, sometimes you do need the experience and the expertise of those who would have been there and done that to come back and exert some of that experience, uh, impart some of that experience uh, to us who are here presently managing agriculture here on the island of Nevis. I would want to say to you as well that this particular uh, event this morning, I will want to go out on a limb and say that we will have a similar event in St. Kitts as well, or similar activity. Uh, because as we go here in Nevis, we also want to uh, do likewise on St. Kitts, both islands moving together to build a strong and sound sector. We've always heard about resiliency. We've always heard about sustainability. It cannot be done unilaterally, so you must have a dual approach in terms of getting the job done. But I want to speak specifically about uh, Mr. Augustine Merchant and his role. When we engaged him six months ago, uh, the thought process then was to ensure that we are having some accountability in terms of reporting and also in terms of what is to be done to ensure that we hold all of the persons who we expect to deliver for us at the Department of Agriculture are doing their job. And as such, we would have uh, sat down with Mr. Merchant and come up with what we believe is a sound uh, pathway towards ensuring that we are achieving the goals and objectives that we would have set out to achieve. I indeed, one of the things that he was charged to implement was this very same reporting session where we have a formal reporting of all of the divisions within the Department of Agriculture, whether it be the vet division, the uh, uh, abattoir, we also have the agro-processing unit, livestock division, uh, marketing, forestry division, and the quarantine division. What is important is that all of these particular divisions are dependent on each other. Vet is dependent or the abattoir is dependent on the veterinary services to ensure we are getting healthy carcasses at the abattoir. The same thing with the extension division. Their work and energies should be um, geared towards ensuring that we are maintaining a healthy food chain in terms of the crops and produce that we bring to our market. The marketing division also is important to all of those various divisions because, of course, they are the ones who go out into the field or into the marketplace to determine what is essential for our hoteliers or supermarkets and our various consumers here on the island of Nevis. So everyone is dependent on each other and it must be a wholesome approach to what we do in agriculture in order to ensure that we are achieving what we have set out to achieve in terms of sustainability and of course resilience in the sector. That being said, it is not always an easy task to achieve your objectives, but of course, there must be some foundation set and at least a foundation to build upon to ensure you're getting or uh, moving towards uh, the um, place you want to get to. I want to say at this point in time that what you'll realize today from these reporting session is that it gives us an idea and it gives us a chance to gauge as to what we are doing here on the island of Nevis. We have always heard that agriculture is doing well, but what do you have to show that agriculture is doing well? Without the numbers, without the actual data, you won't be able to plan, program, and implement policies so as to guide the sector forward. So that is why it is important. And of course, I myself as the minister, when I stand up, I want to say we have planted five acres of watermelon and we, we have had a yield of X amount of pounds. I want to speak with confidence. And that is why these sessions will be important moving forward so that we can speak on a quarterly basis so that at the end of the year we'll have an annual reporting as well as to what we've done throughout the year. So data will help to guide us to build a sector that is sound and of course you know, we are coming out of, not coming out, but we are experiencing this pandemic, COVID-19. While we have some downtime with our hotel sector, it gives us a chance also to start to plan accordingly and to put 
measures in place so as to ensure when we have that rise and that boom again, we are ready and rearing to fulfill the demands and expectations of our stakeholders. It is easy for us to uh, plant a large supply, a large amount of produce today, and then smile about it in three months, and then thereafter, the fourth month, we don't have anything to show. That is why these reporting uh, sessions are important, to know how you can do your crop scheduling. And the data that you get from these reporting, you can then plan uh, throughout the year and ensure we have some sustainability in various crops and various um, vegetables here on the island of Davis. Now, I know you didn't come to hear me this morning. You have come to hear the exciting news from the eight, I believe, eight different divisions within the department who I believe have done a good job in putting their, their numbers together and are ready to share it. We'll document it. And coming out of this session today, we'll be able to, uh, I believe, plan adequately and put a sound pathway in place so that we can really say at the end of the year moving forward that coming out of COVID-19, one of the positive things that we've been able to do is to reestablish this reporting session. And another important thing is that we'll be able to gauge ourselves moving forward in terms of the market that we're supplying to and making sure we're supplying the food that is needed to feed our people. I want to thank you very much for listening. I want you to uh, participate at the end of all of the reporting that will be done so that we can you know, gather and garner some important information to guide us as we move forward to build this all-important sector. Thank you very much for listening, and we, I wish this session every success. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Jeffers. Obviously, all protocols observed. And I would also want to recognize those persons who are joining us online. We have a YouTube link that is up. So even after this session is done, it'll be, it will be available on the Information Superhighway. Without any further ado, we'll go straight into the presentations. And up first, we have the Quarantine Division, Mr. Quincy Bart, and yes, Quincy, come, come. <laughs> Quincy has been rearing and ready to go for about a month now, so <laughs> so we now invite Mr. Bart to, to make his presentation. Yes, good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to establish the protocol that already established before me. I'm here to present to you um, Quarantine Division, um, the third quarter report. 
All right, imagine waking up one morning to one of these at your doorstep. Quarantine protects this from happening by protecting your food and the environment. Many people think the role of a quarantine officer is just to write a piece of paper for a phytosanitary certificate to bring in exported goods or an import permit saying that they need to bring in stuff. But no, we have many other roles. When agricultural communities come to the island, we'll, we go out and we inspect them for any pests and diseases. We conduct surveillances to monitor certain pests and diseases. In order, also we work along with agencies such as Extension Division, giving them importation data for the farmers and the, to um, plant the right commodities. In, in, agri in the division, we divide it into agricultural commodities inspections in terms of risk. We have low risk commodities and high risk commodities. The low risk commodities is when the incidence of a pest um, is low. Normally these commodities are processed goods as you can see here, cooked goods, frozen products. However, we have the high risk commodities. These commodities, the incidence of a pest and disease survival is, is high. So you see here we have cut flowers. We urge that importers bring in, state the, their origins, because many of these producers of cut flowers, they are consolidators and they gather up all different cut flowers around the world. So once, once you are an importer, you have to state, all right, I'm bringing in roses from America, tulips from Holland. We urge we urge um, importers, where, when they're bringing in seeds, to buy seeds from an accredited um, seed company. See here we have a accredited seed company. You see the product name. It tells you what type of seed it is and uh, what type of resistance of diseases it has. However, during the quarter we found many um, seed packages, they're not labeled properly. When we inspect the seeds, they have pest and disease damage. And sometimes they're mislabeled. For instance, this one here, you go thinking that it's studded earrings. When customs come, then they inspect it, they find seeds. So we urge um, individuals to get seed certified seed companies. Also, we work along with the pesticide board. The pesticide also we work along with the pesticide board so that um, when we bring in when people bring in pesticides, we can regulate them, and no banned pesticides should be um, brought into the country. I would like to state that for the quarter, no, no pests and diseases were detected. So that's a, a great news. However, we urge that all, all agricultural commodities of a, in the high risk commodity needs an import permit. So you have to come at the Department of Agriculture, fill out an import permit, before the community reaches here. Also, uh, also, sometimes we trade among countries that we don't accustomed to trade with. This, we, when this happens, we need to conduct a pest risk analysis. A pest risk analysis is just an analysis to, said, to say, 
what are the likely chances of a pest coming to the country, whether it's a high or low level? As, as I mentioned before, we, look, we work along with different agencies and uh, normally we c collect certain importation data of fruits, niche crops, and crops that can be easily grown here. As you see in the table here, we um, tabulated um, for the quarter, onions to be in the, the most, followed by the yellow corn, so around 35,000 pounds of onion is brought in just for this quarter alone. And you notice tomato, it's on the lower end. The reason why tomato is at the lower end is due to the high production of uh, farmers planting tomatoes. So they work along with the, the um, supermarkets and they decrease um, importation. We want all commodities to be like tomato on the lower end. Department is working on closely just not to bring in quarantine pests. A quarantine pest is a pest that you do not want into the country. As you see here, this is a, a snail of a giant African um, snail, a shell. So the thing is, this snail is originated from Africa. However, it's made its way throughout the Caribbean and it's very close to us. The closest island of to date is Antigua. This snail has a very big appetite. Also, it mates quickly. It can mate with itself and uh, it is very hard to control. So we doing much surveillances to control these. Export of uh, crops. We urge that when you're exporting, bring all of the commodities you're bringing, not a sample. So the reason why we need to inspect all of the commodities for any pest and disease. My good friend Lindsay, he will give, share some um, commodities that you cannot um, take out of the island, such as mangoes. Mangoes, you cannot, fresh mangoes, you cannot export them to the, the US mainland. You cannot export mangoes to the UK as well. Also, you see the uh, list of palms. One palm that you cannot bring in due to the, the occurrence of pests and disease is coconuts. And they have a, a list of other varieties as well. We have um, a ban list of importe, imports. You cannot bring in any ba banana planting materials due to um, certain diseases, such as the, the Fourierism wilt, race four. So those things, we are trying to um, educate our impo importers and exporters. Surveillance, we're conducting two surveillance on the island right now, the food fly surveillance and the mango seed weaver surveillance. Also, we work along with the, the, fa the farmers to identify pests and diseases on their farms, and we have a software called PestNet that you take a picture, upload it on the site, and uh, an expert can give you diagnostics. Yeah, we have food fly surveillance. This is a a trap that um, catches the fruit fly. The fruit fly is a, a fly that lays its eggs on soft-bodied fruits, and, the, and it's, once it lays its eggs, the larva hatches, and uh, it diminishes the marketability of the food. So here's an example of what we do. 
in food supply surveillance. Also, we tabulate the results and map them in our database. Thus far, we detected we have 16 active food flies, 16 active traps, and we caught four food flies. The mango seed weaver, this is the process of mango seed weaver. We catch the mango, we harvest the mangoes, dissect it, and uh, observe to see if any mangoes are in the, in the seed. Because the mango seed weaver, it eats the seed of the mango. And this, this, these are the results. Thus far, we, we capture 13 adults, um, two, two larvae, and one um, egg. And these are the, the maps of the active areas of the mango seed weevil. Thus, as I mentioned, we work along with the farmers, and these are the the types of insects and pests that are affecting the, the farmers right now. Worms being the, the most devastating because they, they, they defoliate the leaves significantly. As I mentioned, thus this year um, we do a lot of public awareness. However, due to COVID and the restriction of certain rules and regulations, we, we're not um, doing that as much. But however, we were able to um, go on the radio station uh, on, with Banky, and it was a well-received um, station. We were able to address certain quarantine rules and regulations and pest management systems, and it was well received. The way forward for agri for, for the division is to do more p pest um, surveillance by different types of um, chopping systems. Also, we're working along with our different agencies because baggage um, inspections are is a high risk where pests and diseases can enter. So we're working along with the USADA and we're creating posters. So these posters here, you'll see them on different points of entry, letting people know that when they come to the country, must declare whatever they have in their baggage. Also, we're working with the printing, um, with the observer to, to post up different types of posters in uh, different areas. So, um, different types of concerns, uh, we need human resources, and more public awareness and working along with um, the general public to inform the rules and regulations for quarantine division. I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and uh, I do hope you engage with any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bart. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit of housekeeping. Can, can we all see the screen, or do we? Okay.
Okay. Uh, the idea generally is to open the floor after each presentation. Do we have any questions, concerns, observations with regards to quarantine? Establish, you will make it to a cross. So, by inter island um, movement, so I'm wondering if the ban list are also covered on both islands. Is this collaboration that way? Yes, yeah, so I just to address um, question number two. Yes, the ban list is um, common, especially with the, the palms. Every year we go to uh, the CPHD, the Caribbean Plant Health Directors um, Forum, and we make certain dis decisions. And uh, one decision that we made was to ban certain types of um, palms. As you know, we had an a, a outbreak of lethal yellowing, and it this kind of demolished the coconut industry. However, we gain, we do certain um, resistant varieties. So now the coconut industry is getting back. However. There is a disease named lethal bronzing disease, and this disease is similar to um, lethal yellowing. However, it does not have any resistant varieties. So um, due to um, caution and risk management, we said we did, did our research and said, all right, this is the list of palms. We'll have to um, put a hole on them until we have a certain type of protocols to follow. And uh, in terms of this, the seeds, we have a database on the seeds that collected and we, we, uh, we, we are able to see what types of seed companies follow certain rules and regulations and, and those type of things there. We notice that seeds coming from um, China, they don't follow um, rules, certain rules and regulations. But other seed companies, they do follow the basic rules and regulations. Question. Um, coupled to our surveillance, we do um, food sampling as well. Because sometimes the food fly, okay, if you catch a food fly in a, in a mango tree, it does not necessarily mean that the food fly is infesting the, the, the mango tree. Maybe it's attracted to the bait. So we do um, food fly, um, food sampling, so basically um, test to see if, it's, if you have any signs of puncture wounds also. We, um, we put it in a, in a trap and try to hatch them out. And suppose there are any hatchings of um, food flies, we know, okay, these food flies is infested, infesting the 
um, mangoes. But thus far, we haven't found any fruit flies affecting any mango fruits in Nevis. However, we found that the um, gut plums, they infest the, um, the gut plums. Yes, yes. Um, w when we started, we got a, a expert from Suriname, and she she did a lot of capacity training with us, identifying certain food flies, and uh, and able for us to conduct certain surveillances to better prepare for us. And also, we have a system where we we train in um, from in Trinidad and it allows us to map the certain food flies because this type of map tells you where the incidence of an outbreak could occur and those type of things there. We have the software that can do that. Thank you. Just a quick comment and then something about the, the list. Um, yeah. I know that when you spoke about risk, yes. you only mentioned the direct risk, the plan, plans and planned parts. I think it's also useful for persons to know that non-planned items are also considered. Yes, because, yes. Because, um, you know, you do on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it depends on where the, where the consignment is coming from. For example, um, tiles often may have a lot of snails yes. on them. Um, and they're what you call hitchhikers, um, all kind of insect pests might be in a container. So that one also looks at non-plant items. Maybe not at the same scrutiny. Sometimes law risk, depending on where the source and so on. Um, I just thought it might have been useful for you to share something like that with, the, with us. I won't go over this too much. The peers sort of asked the question related to it. What I would suggest though, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have the, the list in. AICA sponsored a study in the Federation by a gentleman, I think his name was um, Dr. McKenzie. I might be wrong on his name. Um, he looked at, he classified the, the, the likely pests that we have and um, what we should be careful of. Um, and he gave a whole listing. I thought that this list could be a lot more extensive. Yes, the, the listing that he gave us um, is quite a lot. And um, some of the, the, the listings we have here, I don't know if, for example, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm interpreting this correct. Mm -hmm. But if, I'm, if I am, there are one or two concerns. I would suggest that you can check with, if you don't have the list, maybe whether it's through AICA or through the, the St. Kitts unit, we can share the total list with you. And yes. whether you want to select from it or to check for consistency yes. so that um, we, we would have, we would have a common list because there's this big um, overall study that was done for the whole Federation. Okay? Thank you. Yes. Yes, we do. All right, we, we do have um, some information, and I think you were talking about the, the pest list of uh, for Sink It's and Nevis. I think we have those and also the quarantine pest list as well. But I did not bring this information today. Any more questions? In the interest of that. I want to thank Mr. Bart for his presentation and in the interest of time, we'll take two questions 
after each presentation. So um, hopefully we don't have to spend all day here. But um, I now invite Mr. Elvin Sutton from our engineering or small farm equipment pool who will now make his presentation. Morning, everyone. Morning. I'm of the protocol that was established. I'm um, going to be doing the report for Small Farm. Um, general duties we do land preparation both for farmers and government, um, community as well. Also, do some of the land preparations that we do is plow, harrow, bedding. We also do brush cutting. We also do tobacco service as well as mulching. Mulching service that we provide is you have trees instead of throwing them away um, to the dump, you can mulch them, reuse them around your plants, your flowers, whatever. Maybe. And we also service the department vehicles, so the Jeep and the pickups that the department have. Instead of taking them to the garage, bring them down to the, to the department and to a unit and we, we service them. As well as we service the implements for the, the, the tractors as well. Um, so the work that was carried out for the quarter, we, we have land prep for farmers, uh, which is 62 acres. Land prep um, free service is just an acre. When, um, we have, through the quarantine, we, we did quite a few service um, for farmers free of charge. We do back of service as well as land preparation, plowing, harrow and bedding. We mentioned just an acre here, but um, that's just for the quarter, even though we were run, we run up to a time, I think in July, but we went over just a bit and just so happened that just an acre um, have done. But if you reflect to the past um, quarters, you would see there is quite a few. There is 11 acres within the within that that second quarter. Um, we also do battle battle services and. Um, Paid, we have 30 hours free free service. We have 27 community slash government. We have 48 hours. Now that 48 hours is for other depart departments within the government that we will do that service that service for. Here's where we we compare um, from last quarter up to to. Last year quarter to this year's quarter with where we have 40, 40 40.7 acres. With this quarter we have 62. Um, quite a few farmers, we had quite a few farmers that take um, use of the free service that was 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 handed out. So that's why you would see that that high number of acres that is being covered. As I said, that, that one acre, if you see for that last quarter we, we have a zero. And for this one, we have a one that's just for this quarter. But if you see previous, we have um, quite a few acres covered. As we go down, back of services, we have 20, 30, 30 hours compared to, to 26 of last time. And the free service, we have 27 compared to last year quarter of zero. And as we go down, we, the brush cutting, we just have um, three quarters of acre, 0 0.75, which is just about three quarters of an acre, with the brush cutting that is being done. No, so three problems that I would have um, with, with with the high down term. The high down term is because um, the lack of parts for both the tractors and implements at times. Sometimes we not getting the, the amount of parts ordered. Sometimes we order out of parts and we may get short shortage. We order this and bolts. We may just get the this without the bolt. So that's what some we they they're not getting the amount of parts ordered. Farmers not requesting the proper land preparation because of, of the faulty implement. The faulty implement is that we have a better that bears for this. And to have it a break off and we, we try and with it to, to to still get the service provided. So because of that, you know, some of the farmers, they don't feel, which we try to advise to them that they could just plow one harrow 
and plant, it wouldn't, it would be, they, they do as much as if you just bed. But they, some believe in, you know, they, they want the high beds to plant in. They don't believe in the flat. So, um, recommendation I have is like to improve the timeliness of ordering the parts, obtaining the amount of parts ordered. And as well as extension officers um, to suggest to the farmers to, to do the, the proper land, land prep techniques. Um, as well as the, the extension officers goes out, you know, your farmers, it's, you could advise to them, well, you know, we, we, the better is done right now, you could just plow your hand, your land, harrow it and get into planting instead of waiting for, for that better to, to be back up. As well as the extension officers could suggest to the farmers as well to remove the stones because of the stones in the land um, that would, would be the cause of some of the time we better be in, being um, down, break down on us now. Now my focus for the, for the upcoming quarter is working closely with the farmers to encourage them to practice the low, low, low tillage. Now low tillage is where you take a, a crop out, instead of going to, to get the land plow again, you just clean the land and you can replant, replant the, the land. Um, doing more farm visit to ensure that the, the operator is doing the proper land, land prep. As well as working closely with the extension officers to ensure that the proper land technique is being carried out. Now, with all that, um, small farm, we strive to, to promote the buy local, eat local, Working with the farmers closely. With that, I would end here. Thank you. Any questions, comments, observations? I'll be moving on. Thank you. Um, I know I know we concern that um, a lot of the challenges, downtime, um, equipment, and so on, uh, similar to the challenges that we're facing in St. Louis. Um, so um, there's a commonality there. Um, I, I know that as as presented. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Uh, without any further ado, I see Dr. James is rearing and ready to go as well. So, invite Dr. James to present on vet services. Pleasant good morning to all of you. My name is Ambrose James, and I'll be presenting on our third quarter report. The effects of the tropical bond tick continue to be of significant importance for us on the island. During the third quarter, we continued our active, active surveillance and treatment program, which have been in place for a number of years. Let me now draw your attention to a summary of the surveillance data during the months of July, August, and September. We managed to visit over 200 farmers each month during the third quarter. During the third quarter of every year, there is usually a significant increase in the number of ticks due to the favorable climatic conditions for their multiplication. This is reflected in the figures seen in the table, where a total of 1,315 males and 371 females were removed from the 476 hosts they were attached to over the three-month period. In July, August, and September, the number of hotspot farms recorded from the total visited were 26.16%, 26 
27.83% and 32.01% respectively. We noted, however, that even though the tick population increased, the number of dermatophilosis cases recorded was relatively low. In the, th in the third quarter, the chemical flumethrin, which is used to kill the tropical bond tick, was very low in stock at one point, then eventually ran out because, well, before we could restock. This was mostly due to the unavailability of the chemical in the region. As such, we only managed to treat 51.61% of the hotspot, hotspot farms in July and only 21.13% in August. In September, we received our supply of the chemical and therefore managed to treat almost 70% of the farms positive for the tick. Note the quantity of beta cal used in September as opposed to the previous month. A major and important part of our duties at the Veterinary Livestock Division is providing ambulatory health care. Although it may appear as though there are quite a bit of diseases and conditions we have to deal with, in fact, we are grateful that we do not have a very serious, infectious, and contagious zoonetic diseases that affect humans, or diseases such as African swine fever that can lead to devastating economic insults to the pork industry. Okay, although the table looks very detailed, I will only highlight a few cases of interest. Note the high figures for the internal parasitism cases. The number can be misleading and only reflects what the health officers treated for the farmers. Most farmers, however, routinely treat their animals themselves. So the actual number of animals treated for internal parasitism would be considerably higher. Hmm. Dog bite wounds and overall livestock loss due to dog attacks continue to pose an imminent threat to the small ruminant industry. These figures reflected the number of animals treated and not those that were killed by dogs. My apologies for the, for the slide and the background. Sorry? No. no. We have a total of four persons currently pursuing career in the veterinary livestock field. Three are reading the, the diploma program in animal health and veterinary public health and one an associate degree in veterinary technology. Later this month, another will be leaving to start a master's degree program in tropical agriculture. We wish them all much success in their studies. Breed improvement is always a priority in livestock production, and one way this can be achieved is through artificial insemination. We propose to initially select one farmer from each district and then carefully select five those from each herd to be a part of this pilot project. Once successful, the project will be distributed island-wide and eventually artificial insemination in goats would be an additional service provided by our division. We recognize that efforts to eradicate the tropical bontic have become an enormous and virtually impossible task. We therefore understand that control of the parasite is key. Subsequently, we will limit active surveillance to each farm being surveyed once per quarter instead of the monthly visits we currently do. Treatment with the chemical will continue as per usual, with the chemical also being available to farmers for purchase. This redistribution of resources will afford us the opportunity to increase officer farmer contact time, hence strengthening the livestock extension aspect of our duties. This will also allow us to focus more on health-related areas such as sample collection for laboratory analysis and disease detection and prevention. We want to establish a greater collaboration between veterinary services and livestock unit, especially on matters and projects pertaining to animals. We also want to have regular meetings and training sessions with livestock farmers. Next slide. There are quite a number of challenges that can be mentioned, but today I will only highlight a few major ones. Inadequate, improper, or at times, the absence of communication within the department and the division. 
Effective communication is the building block of successful organizations and therefore is significant in the organization's ability to perform basic functions of management, which are planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. A lot can be said about improper communication or the l apparent lack of it in our department, but we, under sorry, but we must be ready to highlight the various barriers of communication, analyze the reasons for their occurrence, and take preventative steps to avoid those barriers. Readily available funds for procurement of chemicals, other drugs, and equipment. At times, money isn't available to purchase much-needed drugs and equipment in a timely manner. This disrupts the normal workflow and often would lead to unfavorable repercussions. We understand that the effects of COVID-19 put an almost unrepairable dent in the global economy, and unfortunately, Oz and Nevis was not spared. Therefore, the financial challenges will likely persist. Farm site interaction with farmers. Customarily, most livestock farmers do not solely rely on farming as their source of income. They usually have a regular eight to four job with livestock farming as a hobby or as a supplemental income. This means that the time the animal health and livestock officers are most active and available to visit farms is the time that these livestock farmers will be at their jobs. Therefore, trying to discuss and troubleshoot important matters and disperse vital information, especially relating to unfarm practices, becomes a serious challenge. Thank you for your time. Any comments, concerns, clarification? Sure. Is the department ready more so the division ready to undertake artificial insemination of the courts? Um, um, I would say we are about 60-70% there. Just a few um, drugs we need um, to do what we call a synchronization of the animals, and we should be ready. They're not very difficult. Yeah, not. Within this month, yeah. Any other? Thank you very much. Yeah, they're working hard. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. And we'll continue in the area of livestock, and we invite Mr. Kelso Clark, our livestock extension officer, to make this presentation. And I want to comment before, well, after you finish. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelso, my name is Kelso Clark, and I will be presenting on the livestock unit for last quarter. For this presentation, I will be doing an introduction, the aims of the modern stock farm, the aims of the, life, the, aims of the livestock extension, the rainfall data, revenue data, cattle, produ pop cattle population, breeds of animals, general farm activities, extension activities, constraints for the stock farm, constraints for the livestock extension, recommendations for the stock farm and extension. 
The livestock unit is comprised of the Madden Stock Farm and the extension. The farm is about 250 acres and we have 10 rotational paddocks. And with the extension, we give techni technical advice to farmers. The aims of the Mad Madden Stock Farm, we aim to provide a genetic pool to farmers so that they can improve the area of production and also to provide animals to the abattoir and also to use the farm as an educational tool for farmers. For the livestock extension, we aim to give technical advice in husbandry practices in our livestock. Okay. With this graph, um, the numbers are not showing up. We had an increase of rainfall in August due to the systems that pass near our islands. And the revenue generation, we only had revenue for August of $5,000 for sale of animals. For the cattle production, for July, we had 81 animals, August, 77, and uh, September, we had 71. The breeds of animals. On the Madden Sock Farm, we have pigs, we have duroc and land race, land large white, sorry. We have the Senepole, which is the nucleus herd, and also the red Angus bull. We have the brown Angus bull, the Senepol bull, the Brahman bull, and we have we acquired one boa buck from Ross University. Okay, general activities for the Madden Sock Farm during this quarter. We did fence rep repairs in, in posts and the wire. Also, we air tag our animals, we air notch our calves. And every Friday, we check the animals for any injuries. We did our head counts and we, with the help of the animal health team to assist in any tick treatment. We also, we also cut grass for our animals and we do this basically for the five bulls that are in the feedlot system and we give them ration, chip grass, molasses, and mineral supplements. And for the extension activities, we give technical advice to all farmers, including in the areas of housing, depending on what you are raising, you need the adequate structures to do your area production. The extension activities, we assist persons who have experience animals trespassing on the property, and we give them technical advice. We educate farmers on the Pound Act, and also we assist farmers in water concessions or vehicle concession. And our technical advice goes to all farmers, whether it's poultry, pig, goat, sheep, cattle, and rabbit farmers. Some of the constraints for this Madden stock farm. Farm equipment to process forage for animal consumption. We need a commercial grass chipper that can able to withstand the load of cutting our, chipping our grass. We need tools to cut trees, tools such as chainsaw, as opposed to the, the workers using the cutlasses. And we need a need for office space and proper storage facility. One of the constraints for the livestock stock farm is that we need more trained persons to help us to do our extension. Recommendations for the Madden stock farm, starting of the small ruminant program, the pig production unit, the fodder bank development, the offering training to farmers, silage production, and removing some of the overgrown trees in our paddocks. Recommendations for extension will be working hand-in-hand hand with the stock farm as a model farm, 
in educating farmers on silage, making molasses urea blocks, and uh, educating farmers on how to do further production. Demos in homemade chicken feeders and waters, and uh, we continue to make fact sheets available to the farmers so that they can be educated. And also, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> We started our forage bank. We started planting sugarcane. We are planning to expand it, and we're going to plant mulatto grass, guinea grass, elephant grass, trichanthera, and the leguminous species include wild tamarind, glaricidia, and uh, yes, that is basically all. All in imagines, yes. Uh, it's about where the further bank is about two acres. Sorry, it's about three acres. It's about three acres, sorry. Just want to wish Kelso. All the best. He's, this is his last presentation with us for a while. He's be off to Taiwan to do some studies. He was, I think he was the person that Ms. Dr. James uh, referred to who was doing the masters in tropical agriculture. Yes, so congratulations to Mr. Clark. In livestock, um, we, have, we have the livestock extension, we have veterinary services, and, and to round it all up, I think where we want to be in agriculture, um, all these animals end up at the abattoir. So, <laughs> invite Mr. Griffin to, to make his presentation. Okay, good morning all. Um, my presentation today, um, the Navy Saboteur, we'll go to receiving of animals. Um, receiving of animals is done um, twice weekly. Um, we receive animals on Sundays, um, 7 to 10, and on Mondays, uh, 7 to 11. Um, during the week, we also may extend a bit um, if we have extra processing um, as it needs be we may extend to Wednesdays and so forth. Um, so it, animals, as they come into the abattoir, they go into the holding area, which they have to um, wait there for about 12 to 24 hours uh, before slaughtering, so the animal could um, rest properly um, because um, the rest of the animals is important for the inspection period afterwards. Okay, um, some statistics, um, a comparison between the number of animals slaughtered in 2020 versus the number of animals slaughtered in um, 2019. The total number of animals slaughtered um, for this quarter uh, were 997 animals, which represent a decrease of 10% in comparison to the same period of um, 2019. Um, the reasons for the decrease in the number of animals slaughtered um, Major, there was no cultural armor. Cultural armor, around cultural armor is one of uh, the second um, highest period during the, during the year for us. Um, because there was no cultural armor, the number of animals slaughtered went down. And also, um, due to the COVID, um, we were closed for a period. And then when we reopened, um, we had a restriction, a cap on the number of animals that each person um, could have brought into the animal, um, to the abattoir. And also, we have the unavailability of, um, say, cattle, more so, for processing of um, meat products. Um, 
meat cut and process. The quantity of meat cut um, for this quarter was 50,752 pounds, which also is a decrease of 11.96% comparison to the same period of 2019. The revenue collected for this period of meat, for meat cutting was 10,000. $259.34, which is also an increase of 26.5% in comparison to the same period of 2019. This, was, this is a result of um, cutting for uh, supermarkets, like Ram Supermarket, as, and also um, Food Center um, here on Nevis. We go now into processing. Nevis Abattoir is very unique. Um, unlike many others, uh, we also involve in processing and value-added products. We pride ourselves um, in doing 23 value-added products. Um, for this quarter, we did a total of 1,630.5 pounds of beef burgers, which is also a 90% increase of the same period of last year. Since COVID, we had an increase in the number of persons vending burgers and so forth. So this, this quantity went up. Ground beef process for this quarter, 4,643 4, pounds, which is about 6.98% less than, um, than the previous period. Uh, we have challenge, challenges getting um, cattle for doing ground beef, as well as burgers. There was also an 11% increase in the processing of chicken burgers compared to the similar period of last year. Already for this year, um, we have already prepped 1,093 pounds of um, smoked ham um, towards the Christmas season. Our target this year, um, we did last year roughly 260 plus hams. Our target this year is somewhere over 300 um, hams. Um, shortly, we should be um, sending out the flyers for, for order, ordering and so forth. Um, so we have another, another approximate maybe 200 plus for preparation for the, the rest of the, of the quarter. All meat processors at the abattoir are done from um, farmers, local farmers. And uh, the monies that we paid out to local farmers for meat for this quarter for a total of $123,150.75, which is also an increase of 96% compared to the last quarter. Carcass weight. We had a decrease in approximately 13.7 pounds compared to the last period um, in, the, in, the, in terms of carcass weight. And we had also had an increase about 180% in chicken, um, the number of chicken being processed, local chickens, that is. We also um, get some beef from our, our sister islands, um, Sinkets, um, to aid in the processing of um, ground beef as well as burgers, which had a total of about 4,534 pounds. Okay, some of the challenges um, we faced during the, the quarter. We have insufficient raw material, mainly beef, for processing. Um, on a weekly basis, uh, we have to um, supply supermarkets with ground beef, with burgers. We have a lot of vendors doing burgers, especially since COVID. So we have an, an increase in the, uh, in the number of persons doing this stuff. Getting beef for this, um, item, or doing these items is a, is a bit of a challenge. Also, mutton. Is something that is quite um, in big demand. We have either unavailability or the inadequate amount of um, mutton passing through the abattoir. Um, occasional freezer problems. Um, these freezers require constant monitoring. Um, there's a, a electrical. Um, you don't have get warning when you when they're going to something going to go. Um, so you have basically have to constantly, even on weekends, even after hours, check these freezers because for some reason, or for one minute it's working, the next minute it's done. You have thousands of pounds of meat in these freezers to protect, so they require constant monitoring. 
um, all the time. We also have occasional downtime, so in terms of slaughtering. We have a heating tank where we use a scalding tank for animals, which carries uh, two large elements. Occasionally, these elements are bound up. Um, we procure these elements from the UK, but generally we normally have spares. So as the element goes down, we replace them with the new ones, then we reorder um, new ones and always have um, backup and so forth. Um, that is as far as I think we go. I don't know if there's any questions. Feel free. There's some mention of increase in terms of the purchases from the local businesses, right? Um, is this because of the COVID, which may have restricted some level of, of, of import? Or are we zooming in on the market and strategically? Well, generally, generally, in, in, in the United States, the supermarkets, brands, Valimar, um, Chinese supermarket, and all the local vendors, uh, we provide with Rambi as a whole. But we find them, burgers especially, we have a huge influx since COVID. Uh, the new people who are in part the use of work, four season use of work, some at some risk, some risk. They're getting involved in um, doing burgers here and doing burgers there. So we had an, a huge increase in the amount of um, burgers that we had to process for these new people um, on the market. Sure. sheep and goat and pigs. We, we, um, we request the animals, farmers bring the animal into us, whether it be cat, sheep or goat pigs, we slaughter, we weigh the carcass, we pay for the carcass. Um, the other items, liver, feet, head, if necessary and the far farmer needs those, they get it. If they don't, we accept, we pay for also for those. Um, in terms of the tripe and so forth, we have a tripe room. We clean all tripe. 
If the farmer requests the tribe, there's a fee attached for cleaning the tribe. If the farmer doesn't request the tribe, the abattoir then takes the tribe and sells it. Right. I think specifically what you are saying that is whether the abattoir or we buy animals from the farmers throughout the island. And the answer is yes. Meaning, farmer A, he has cattle for sale, the abattoir will buy it from them. You buy live weight. Um, no, carcass weight. Carcass weight. Oh, okay. Good. And then we use that same carcass to process the ground beef and burger patties, as they said, right? The government itself also has some livestock, and those are sent to the agriculture as well. But most of the purchases that are from individual farmers throughout the entire island. And he did mention that the purchases we sent there is from Simpsons as well. A couple of farmers have been told. So that is something that we would. Because these these carcasses, mm -hmm. these carcasses are slaughtered at the abattoir. Oh, oh, okay, okay. We go down. Pick, um, they have the weight. We have the weight. Oh, okay, so okay. it is. Right. It is. Okay. Okay. I think the, the difference between centuries and this one is that uh, we still have a lot of we call it. We are one of the butchers. We are retail. They own the meat. They have the market. Public market. They have the customers and whatever. There's just a few over here now. Yeah. Yeah, you see. Um, the issue, the reason, um, the issue, you ask the question, if we, we, the reason why we do, it's, it's much easier to do carcass weight versus live weight. A lot of people, for example, butchers and leavers, they go around purchasing and guessing. I'm not really into the guessing game. I have seen, um, because I have the statistics, we have the statistics. In the guessing game, you know, somebody would say, okay, I paid. X amount for this animal, and when you put the carcass on the scale, it doesn't add up. You know, so in 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 in, the, in using carcass weight, everybody wins, nobody loses. You know, it's a fair play. You know? That's where that's where we do it. So, so thanks, man. All the 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 no butchering at all, by the way. If, if, if there's any slaughtering, yeah, people do, people does it. Um, sometimes they try. We don't we don't cut any meat at all. That is not slaughtered at the abattoir. Some people try and say, okay, this happened, and we don't we don't do that because it's not been inspected. Um, if we cut, if we get caught by the inspectors, we could you know be in some trouble. So we don't practice that. And that's for security. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. I want to thank Mr. Griffin and, and that winds up, I think, the livestock section of our presentation this morning. We will now move into the agro-processing unit. Um, Ms. Mrs. Shermer England will present our agro-processing.
Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Mistress Sharmel England and I will be processing for the knee, um, presenting for the Nevis Ago Processing Center. Okay, Ago Processing, it contributes significantly towards the development of the agricultural sector. As you can see, it increases the GDP, it provides income and also employment. It provides a source of export and foreign exchange. It can also provide training for um, new and unskilled employees. It stimulates agricultural production. Okay, at the agro processing plant, we process fruits and vegetables and we use purified water. And some of the methods that we use are drying, freezing, pasteurizing, and adding various preservatives. For the third quarter, we did outreach to schools and also to the supermarket. And for the schools, it encouraged continued purchase of items. And for the supermarket, the conversation is ongoing because we had to improve some things like packaging and we had to visit, revisit some of the prices. Um, uh, we are also doing some re-evaluation um, in terms of cost of production to make it more realistic. And we were successful in, a, in, in um, acquiring some new packaging material. As you can see here, this is what we had most of our stuff in. It was just a simple Ziploc bag. And now we have purchased uh, still Ziploc, but it's self-standing, so it looks better on the shelf. Also, we are working on our labels. We want to get some new attractive labels that can also be waterproof that you could, you know, if you're selling anything frozen like the pulps and so on, it would be able to stand in the freezer. Um, during the third quarter, we also continued the stocking up of things like breadfruit, mango, golden apple, tamarind, so that we would have them for the years to come. Okay, mango, as you know, is one of the best crops that we have here in Nevis. As we just say, when mango season is in, mango is banging dog. So we have a lot of mango and there was much talk about it. So a mango pulper was purchased and this mango pulp, it can process up to 80 pounds of pulp in five minutes. The mango pulp, we use it for things like smoothies, drinks, jams, jellies, mango roll-ups. And that same mango pulp, we, are also, we have also started processing for the general public. Um, and that's a picture of the mango pulp. Also, we were able to acquire some shelving and this was help, some help from the Ministry of Agriculture and as you can see they are already in use. For the third quarter we also had an increase in the amount of raw materials that we were able to acquire. One of the reasons was that in the third quarter there was advertising. The general public now knew that we purchased mangoes at a dollar a pound. So we got a lot of mangoes and also last year to me, it seems as if the crop was very slow. And for this year, I have observed from March until now, we are still getting mangoes. So there has been an increase and also because of the state of the economy, people more kind of, you know, gravitated towards us. They wanted to make a little extra money. So they were willing to bring their sauce up, their breadfruit, their whatever. And so whatever we were interested in, we purchased them. Um, at the agro-processing plant, we do over 20 different types of products. But we want to try and narrow it down so that we could concentrate and be good at what we do. And so we want to narrow it down to the composite bread. In the composite bread, we do a variety. Um, the cassava composite bread, which is done in wheat and white. We also do pumpkin, we do green planting, we do moringa as well.
Um, also, we want to concentrate on making fruit concentrates, mainly mango and tamarind, because those are some that we have a good stock of. For instance, for the mango, we have over 5,000 pounds, and we are still collecting mangoes. And for the tamarind, we have over 1,000 pounds of shelled tamarind. And you know, once you get a sour tamarind, it can go a long way. Um, again, we want to concentrate on the food pulp, because we have a good stock of the food pulp in terms of mango, golden apple, and sausage. And the isolalis, it started out slow, but the schools have taken on very well to it. And in a week's time, one school would buy like 300 lollies. And these are not watered down lollies that has um, like um, artificial flavors. These are made from real local fruits that you find right here in Nevis. And the drinks we want to concentrate on about 10, and those are made from also fresh fruits and vegetables found on the island. Um, communication is ongoing with the Sinkis Agro Processing Center because we do need some training. So conversations are ongoing so that we could get some training and so that we could be better at what we do. And these are some pictures of the bread that we do. As you can see here, we have the pumpkin bread. And also, these are some of the concentrates. We had the concentrates in the Ram supermarket, but we were unable to get the size of bottles that we want. So for right now, the bottle that we have is very large, and so the price is you know, a bit expensive. So we are hoping that we could get some smaller bottles. Also, we have the pulp. We have green golden apple, mango, and sausap. And as I said, we want to improve the packaging. Also, as you can see here, these are the lollies. These are mangoes, but we do quite a variety of different food flavors. And these are a sample of our local drinks. This is a little comparison, a little highlight between 2019 and 2020. This is not all that we did, but I just took out some of the numbers. And as you can see from 2019, we got 155.36 pounds. And like I told you, people started bringing whatever they had. So you can see there's an increase in 2020 of 586.13 pounds. Mangoes, as I said, it was properly advertised and the season was extended. So for the third quarter, in 2019, we got 1,006.9 versus for this same period in 2020, we were able to get 2,306.70. Pumpkin, it's a little low. Um, as you can see, in 2019, we got 300 pounds versus in 2020, we got 193. This mainly we use it for bread, but people are getting a bit, you know, health conscious and they're cutting down on the amount of bread they are consuming. So we as, you know, people used to buy maybe two or three bags per week. They are cutting down and they are saying, just give me one bag. So hence the, you know, drop in the sale of pumpkin. Bread food is not by pound. Those are individual bread foods. So as you can see in 2019, we were able to get 97 bread food for the third quarter. And in 2020, we got 339 bread food. Overall, in terms of poundage, we got 3,451.63 pounds in 2019, versus in 2020, we got 5,426.41 pounds, almost 2,000 pounds increase in raw material. And for processing, again, this is just some of what we did. The ice lollies, in 2019, we did 813 lollies versus 2020, we did 2,899. And again, we heavily depend on the schools. They were closed, but they were accustomed to the lollies. So even though we were closed, the parents would still come and purchase the lollies. The local drinks, these are in the 500 ml bottles, what you would locally buy for $5. And in 2019, we had 804 bottles versus for the same period. In 2020, we got 956 bottles. And these can be ordered. You can, you know, you could order them with or without sugar. You could tell us what we need and we could try and cater to you. 
for the bread, as I told you, yes, it is down because people are getting you know, more health conscious and they're cutting down on the amount of bread that they're eating. So for the third quarter in 2019, it was 600 versus for 2020, for the same period, it was 429.5 bags. The food pulp, as I said, you know, last year it didn't seem that if we had much mango, so it was 122.23 pounds versus because of the extended period and the good advertising, we were able for the same period in 2020 to get 1,466.47 pounds of pulp. Some of the limited limitations we had in the third quarter was that the size of the bottles, we couldn't get the bottles that we needed. Sometimes we call, we usually get them from Sinkits and they would be out of stock. And so we couldn't continue some of the stuff that we wanted to do. And another problem we have is getting raw materials. For instance, things like guava. People love, most people love, you know, guava jam or guava cheese. But we hardly get any guava in Nevis. And when we do get the guava, it's such a small quantity that, you know, we just have to process it. We can't do any, sell any pulp. It's just mainly guava jam or guava cheese. Another um, limitation that we have is machinery. We do a lot, a lot of things on hand. We do a lot of things on hand, but we have identified some new machinery to help us, and it's just a matter of time to purchase them. And as you know, COVID-19 has affected all of us, and it also has affected us at the plant where the sales have gone down a little. Um, another factor was, as I said, the packaging. We have to improve on our packaging so that we could be compatible with whatever is on the shelf in the supermarket. So we are working on that. And the price. It is difficult at times. You, you, know, you tell people we are purchasing raw materials for processing, but they are sticking to their prices. For instance, pumpkin, sometimes you get it at $2 per pound for processing, and other times when it is scarce, you're going to get it for $5 a pound, even though you're doing the same thing. For the fourth quarter, for the fourth quarter, we would like to try and get uh, more of our products in the supermarket, and we will continue to seek new markets to expand our clientele and we will try and ensure that our products are of a high quality and we would like to try and purchase, you know, our own bottles or larger quantities of bottles that when we are processing something we don't have to hold off because we don't have any bottles to put them in. We at the Nevis Agro Processing Centre, we encourage you, the general public, to buy local, eat local. I thank you. Any questions? Oh, those are just some pictures of some other stuff that we have. Okay. Yes. Right. And those are that they work on the Okay, thank you for that excellent suggestion. Any other questions? Thank you, Mrs. England. We'll now ask the Extension Division to make their presentation.
good morning to one and all. Um, this morning I'll be presenting the third quarter report for the extension division and the propagation division as well. Oh, my name is Steve Reed and I'm the chief extension officer. First of all, I would like to define the define um, agricultural extension. And agricultural extension, also known as agricultural advisory service, plays a crucial role in the boosting of agricultural productivity, increasing food security, and promoting agriculture as an engine for economic growth. Extension services and objectives. Some of the services offered by the extension service or division are farm visits, data collection, education, crop scheduling, the optimum land use, and good agricultural practices. Let's take farm visits. This is used to monitor the growth of crops and diagnose any problems in relation to nutrients, pests, and disease that may occur during the crop cycle. In data collection, this process entails the collection of planting and harvesting data to advise stakeholders on quantities of production and importation. Simply put it, when the farmer plants, we take this data and uh, share it with the supermarkets, hotels, and any other individual that consume food locally so that they could use this data in order to know whether or not the quantities that are available locally can satisfy the operations or would they need to import. Education, very important. Officers are required to teach farmers new technologies as to increase productivity and efficiency. This is usually done using field demonstrations and workshops. Optimum land use. Technical advice to farmers based on the land's photography, fertility, and location for crop selection and the reduction of erosion. For example, let's say a new farmer wants to establish a farm and uh, they clear the land and they want to plant, let's say, bananas. We at Extension would be able to tell them whether or not we recommend it, given the fact whether or not the prevailing winds are strong in that area that would topple over the, the bananas when they start to fruit, or in terms of erosion, if the land is sloping, what mechanisms to put in place to reduce the speed of the water flow to stop erosion, or the fertility, where some crops basically demand high nutrients, such as corn, versus other crops that can strive well on low fertile soils. And, of course, crop scheduling. This technique is used to sustain constant production of specific commodities throughout the year. Good agricultural practices. Constant supervision and training is given to farmers on the correct use of chemicals, which include the insecticides, fungicides, herbicides on the farms. This also includes the control of domesticated animals, such as dogs. You don't have them roaming and urinating on the crops, aren't you? So we, as extension, keep close eye on these practices. Constraints, no strange thing to us here in the Federation, global warming. We have fluctuating weather patterns that is against the norm. Either extreme drought for long periods or excessive rain for short duration causing um, flooding of crops, erosion, you name it. 
trade year larceny, theft of agricultural equipment such as drip lines, chemicals, knapsack sprayers, shutter valves, and of course, produce. Stray animals, invasion of monkeys, donkeys, sheep, goat, and cows. Farmers also have problems with access to funding. For there is limited access to low interest loans for the farmers. And of course, a lack of insurance. Given that agriculture is high risk as it relates to pests, weather, and markets, insurance is basically non-existent. Here we have a bar chart showing, comparing the targeted crops of what was produced in 2019 versus 2020. In the lighter shade is the 2019 production, and the darker shade is uh, the 2020 production. So as you could see from the chart, um, most of the produce production in 2019 data seems to be higher than this year during this third quarter. And this may have been because of the closure of the hotels and so forth. So the farmers may have not produced as much because the demand might have not been there because a lot of the farmers target the high-end market because of the cost of production. So they want the best price. So, for example, let's take for pumpkin. Last year, we had produced, for the three months, over 31,000 pounds. This year, it was only about 15,000 pounds. So last year, we had a glut of pumpkins. This year, we don't. Um, cantaloupes, however, this year, we see that we produce over 20,000 pounds of cantaloupes within a three months space. And so although the hotels are closed, some farmers utilize the fruit market to, to make some money. In 2019, the comparison between the imports and the local production. In 2019, we noticed that the darker shade would have been the imports, and the lighter shade would be the production for 2019. We noticed that most of the food would have been imported. Um, what stands out would be the importation of cabbage, cantaloupe, carrots, onions, and sweet corn. However, in that same year, we were only able to be basically self-sufficient in pumpkins. Um, we were basically even with sweet peppers, but with tomatoes and watermelons. The bulk of the production was done locally. And finally, the comparison between 2020 production for this quarter versus the imports, where the production is in the lighter shade and the imports in the darker shade. Forgive the color selection and presentation there. Um, we note that the imports, of course, was higher for crops such as cabbage, which prefer a much cooler temperature when this quarter would have been mostly in the dry season. Honeydew and cantaloupes, almost on par, with uh, about maybe a few thousand more pounds being imported. Carrots, the majority of it was imported, our soil type, and as of course the drought. Onions, all for now has been imported. We haven't put in our onion crops as yet. That's why it's at a, a zero. Pumpkin, however, we produce all the pumpkins locally so far for this period. Sweet corn, we have started to see an uptick in the production, although majority of it, over 34,000 pounds have been imported. 
the sweet pepper production is relatively close, more balancedly, but at the same time, we have produced more than imported. I would say the imports in sweet pepper, most of it would have been colored, where the green pepper was fully covered by local production. Sweet potato, if you look at this, we only imported for this three, pe this three months period 7,320 pounds of sweet potato versus the amount that was produced here on island of 16,910 pounds was produced within this three months period. Another success story here is of the tomatoes where we produced over 20,000 pounds of tomatoes during the, this quarter. Note, the import during this time in tomatoes would have been basically plum tomatoes and um, cherry tomatoes because the fresh tomatoes, slicing tomatoes for the table was um, supplied basically from local production. And of course, watermelon, 28,000 pounds was produced here in this period versus the beer 1,172 um, that was imported. The propagation unit. Here I have a pie chart showing the total number of seedlings propagate, propagated for the period from September back to July. Um, as we could see from the pie chart, majority of the seedlings that was propagated would have been the tomatoes, sweet pepper, cabbage, lettuce, and seasoned pepper. Now, um, the cucumbers, the butternut squash are uh, a bit less, but they yield more. As we know, maybe a little more than a quarter acre of cucumber could actually almost flood the market. So those would have been less. The season was also still dry season with the little rains in and out. So the amount of broccoli, cauliflower, and pak choy would have been small. Most of the times that these crops would have an uptick coming on to the cooler times of the year. Number of trees propagated for the same time period. As you could see, mangoes had some wrong selection of colors here. Yeah? But mangoes of a total of 420 mango trees were propagated. We also had a large number of uh, rosemary, thyme, some papaya, and avocados of 223. Now, we have a small section down there, well divided, where you see tangerine, oranges, lemon, and lime. Well, these are being used to establish fields under the forestry unit, I guess he's gonna tell you about that, where we will then be able to sustain production to offer to the general public. Third quarter comparison for vegetable seedlings and fruit trees between 2019 and 2020, the same time period. We see that in 2020, we produced about roughly over 6,000 more seedlings. The fruit trees were basically on par with each other of about 1,174. Um, during this time frame, when mangoes are bearing and most of the fruit trees are bearing, it's very difficult. Uh, we don't do much grafting because the material isn't there to do the process. We normally do most of it after the mango season or before. And the herbs. If you notice that we have a serious drop off with the herbs, that is because of the hotters being closed, most of the oregano and basil and so forth that is normally demanded in the hotels, and these are normally quick growers. Um, the demand for them went down quite a bit. Successes for the year. The stimulus package of water, land preparation, distribution of seeds and seedling, labor and land clearing, that was distributed to farmers and backyard gardeners for free. That was a success. And as you could see with the charts that went before, the fruits of the production 
is there to show. We have also established 12 acres of sweet potatoes with farmers planting up to four acres and we at the department planting eight acres. And presently, based on the time, right now, my colleagues are planting another half an acre and before the month ends, we should be putting in another acre to follow up on what is already being established. And I must note, the yield for sweet potatoes is approximately around 15,000 pounds on the lower side for sweet potatoes. So you could do the maths there when there's 12 acres of sweet potato established. Also, I see my Taiwanese friends in the back. They are also working with us to try to get the sweet potato vines as a vegetable to be introduced to add some supplements so that you could use the vines to generate some sort of revenue as well. We continue with the successes, the water system in New River, which was done by the forest unit, but on the farmer side, they have it as a success because they have more reliable water system. They can now irrigate, if you know the area, the New River area is uh, basically a dry area. Um, subsidizing of fencing wires. We are at the department in collaboration with the ministry, um, the COVID um, stimulus. We told interested farmers, wannabe farmers, backyard gardeners who had difficulty with the roaming an animals, etc., to show us interest by planting the poles and then we will come and provide wires. So we gave out quite a bit of wires to who were, in, who were interested. We didn't give any wires to put, a, put down. You had to plant your post, show us that you were interested. And so that project was successful. We also doing a mapping of farmlands with the aid of the Taiwan Technical Missions using drones to understand, measure, and utilize the farmlands so that we can be more effective in making our decisions. Still under the success, there's quite a bit of success we had within this quarter, a number of seedling distribution to farmers. Um, as you could see here, majority of it was cantaloupe, sweet corn, cucumber, butternut squash, string beans. Now you may see some small numbers here. For example, cantaloupe, you see 10 packs. Each one of those packs have been uh, a 1,000 seeds. That's like 10,000 seeds. And you, we all know how much you could get from one plant. Um, looking at cabbage, that's about three packs of about 3,000 seeds. With each cabbage giving an average weight of four pounds. So although you see the pack figures, there, it made a, a, a serious impact. That's why the graph that we passed before show that cabbage now has a little uptick versus in the past where cabbage around this time period was basically non-existent. Still under successes with our stimulus package, a number of seedlings propagated and distributed to farmers. So the pie chart before showed the seeds, now here seedlings. We gave out sweet peppers, tomatoes, lettuce, seasoned pepper, cabbage, and papa trees. What you see there as to mix, those were mixed trays of seedlings that were given to the backyard gardeners. Now, the definition to the backyard gardeners is like enough to maintain their household without coming to the market to sell. So individuals who might have just have an apartment and a few pots, they have two of this, two of that, you know, that's our definition of backyard farmers, so to speak, for this purpose. So this is another um, success here in extension. Projections for the last quarter. Hosting a minimum of three workshops to train farmers and extension staff in new technology advances in agriculture. I don't know, most of the farmers here would have already gotten a message that we have a workshop tomorrow. So we continue, we're rolling. Um, we continue to establish our three acres of sweet potato production, as I mentioned before, we plant in today. And uh, farmers keep calling, so this figure might be changing. We keep giving potato 
um, slips or ceilings to farmers to establish. Because during the COVID, what we have noticed, rather than planting the lettuce and the tomatoes, which we consider cannot full a belly, a lot of people planting substantial food, such as the starches, the bananas, you know, food that can hold you. They say lettuce can hold you if you're hungry. Um, establishment of one acre of cassava, and this um, cassava is for sale to the general public, but to assist my colleague there in agro-processing, because they do, and they're very creative with this stuff, and um, we, I think we at Extension, we are able to produce this cassava at a low price so that they could mark it up and be competitive with their products. We continue continue of three acres of onion production, which would be in the pot works area. Continue for projections, working closely with the marketing division in order to create a two-way transfer of information to and from the farmers. Now, um, when the staff go in the field, they might find food that is ready to harvest, and they could relate that back to the marketing depot, whether it's the size, the grade, the quantity. Also, feedback on the variety of seeds that they supply, the chemicals, so we have to create that channel so that it's much easier and um, proper data is given to the marketing. Working with small farm equipment pool to ensure that the crop scheduling program stays on target. For example, if the tractor breaks down, it's like the past few days where the weather is wet and they can't go in and plow. We want to have the continuous um, crop scheduling where food is always being planted to sustain. So we find another farmer to plug that gap if that land would not be able. So we could collaborate extension and small farms. Cooperating with quarantine division to, you, to um, use import data to encourage farmers to produce specific crops that is in demand. So rather than everybody planting watermelon and all these trucks are watermelon, and we have the data from quarantine that may say, hey, um, let's say four season imports quite a bit of zucchini. We are now able to take that data and carry it to a farmer. Whether it's seedless cucumber rather than planting the same thing. The yellow watermelon, a whole variation. So we create a market, so to speak, um, by working closely with the quarantine division. The department role in aiding farmers in greenhouse construction. Um, greenhouse construction now is on the boom in Nevis. Um, there may be two reasons. Maybe it's because younger individuals don't want to get into the dirt and it's an easier and more modern way of doing it. Or maybe it's just to protect their investment from the invasive monkeys and stray animals. But it's on the rise. Thus, the department assists um, the farmers with the construction of these um, greenhouses, seeing that we have the internal expertise, having um, established quite a few ourselves, that we are able to help the farmers. And I will end here for now. Thank you. I guess I was that good, no questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Just a good morning, all. My name is Princeton Murray. I step on the straight animal. You did mention monkey. Yes. So the question is do you have um, monkey problems here on the island by the farm? And if so, what percentage of um, damage do you have? And number two, what are some of the methods that are being used by the department to somewhat eliminate that problem? Okay, I can answer the question. Um, I work backwards. Um, I think tomorrow evening we have a workshop on monkey control for farmers. Um, living on Nevis, it is common knowledge. Everyone on the island is affected by monkey. 
mangoes is almost in everyone's yard in certain areas. And in the past, monkeys used to be in the hillside. After the passing of storms, most of the fruit trees in the hills have gone, so they have invaded the farmlands. Thus, it will be an understatement to say it is just a monkey problem. It's that severe. However, the department have embarked on a few different projects that have assisted in reducing the amount of monkey attack. One is the electrical fencing. We have the know-how. We do import it on requests from farmers that, and we go around and we show them how to establish it. The department also used to supply um, fencing wire subsidized, so it's not as expensive to get your perimeter done. We also have other creative ways of controlling the monkey, which I'm not a pleasure to mention right now. <laughs> right? But we're working on it, and thus we're hoping to see the fruits of it. Hopefully, before the year finishes, we should start seeing um, uh, getting less and less um, complaints from both farmers and backyard gardens and household owners as well. You said this workshop tomorrow, tomorrow evening? Yes, starting at 6.30. Yes, 6.30 at Red Cross. Yes. Steve, with respect to the monkey issue as well, what, what I have found, and you might have uh, you know, identified that as well, is that quite a number of our farmers who are, let's say the older farmers, they spend more time on their farm now to, uh, if they're there, then it means they're protecting their farm. Mm -hmm. uh, I can speak of Mike Brown, for example, who used to work at the garage, he's now retired and he spent his time on his farm. M and T is on our farm all day. So quite a number of them are on their farm. That that is to some extent their level of protection for now. Um, of course you mentioned the, the, the solar fence which is yeah. and which is popular houses. here and there and greenhouses is uh, of course. But we hope they don't find a, a way one day to open the door. <laughs> <laughs> we also do have yeah. a few yeah. farmers that are able to train dogs to protect their um, crops from monkey. I don't know how they get it done, but from puppies. So wherever they train them, once monkey come on the farm or close to, the dogs would hunt them, keep them in the tree, run them back over. So um, all this comes with experience, I guess. Um, yeah. What would be most important um, to them uh, is, uh, is to look at the data in terms of how many monkeys they have called in the Yes, we will be completely in the world. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, no, we have at least three to six varieties. What we have done, we still have our local variety that we are custom of planting. That is what the old folks call six months. But given the flow of new youngsters into agriculture, they don't have that time to wait. So we do more three months varieties, some that can be harvested up to two and a half. Um, we get a few varieties from the Taiwanese mission. As I said, one of them, you can use the, the leaves as a vegetable. Um, we also get a lot of sweet potatoes coming over from Sinkins. So some of those varieties we have planted to see how well it does in our soil type and also the shelf life. Um, we have to cover a wide view because let's say, for example, the minister who is a cook, he could tell you which potato he don't want to put in his tea pot because he has a little bit. So there are some to cook, some to bake, some to boil. So we have a wide range. And after harvesting and getting the feedback from the general public, then we are know which ones to tell the farmers, hey, this is what is demanded. This is what um, 
the, the public is asking for. This is what the one that the minister cooks with. So, you know, we use examples like that to get it sold. <laughs> I want to thank Mr. Reed for that all important presentation. We like to acknowledge that extension normally is the backbone of, of agriculture. If, if we have a, a poor extension or a weak extension, we, we won't do well. If we have a strong extension, we'll do well in terms of agriculture. So congratulate Mr. Reed and his team. And our next presentation, we, we, are, we are progressing nicely, we're progressing nicely. Our next presentation comes from our marketing unit. They're, they're at the end of, of what Extension does in that they are the ones who are responsible for getting that food that is produced to the consumers. So we invite Ms. Kelva Liber to make a presentation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My, my name is Kelva Leibard, and I'm here this morning to present to you the third quarter report and our plans going forward for the marketing division. Purpose of the agriculture marketing division. Marketing of farmers produce large and small scale. Procurement of government produce. Sales of agricultural chemicals, such as numectin, bionin, phyton, just to name a few. Procurement of farmers' produce. Sales of seeds, sweet pepper, sweet corn, squash. Sales of farmers' farms' material, boxes and bags, in order to store our farmers' produce properly. Put up the marketing division. For 2020, we have 13,176. 2019, we have 13,868.5. As we can see, there was a 5% decrease. Major crops through the marketing division in the amount of 12,259. Chupo to the four season for the period of July to September in the amount of, in the year of 2020, we have 1,332, 2019, 1,184. As we can see, there was a 13% increase. Payments to crop producers for the period of July to September in 2020. Total for 2020, $35,263.31. Total for 2019, $13,000. $482.14. The reason why um, the figures may be a little high is because of COVID and we decided at the department that we are going to give back to the farmers. The expenditure for the period of July to September for, the, for 2020 $37,102.44. Total for 2019, $35,058.41. 35, 
our expenditure this high, our expenditure for this term would have been a little high because of the purchasing of our chemicals, bags, etc., in order to keep the division up and going. Payment received for chemical seeds and material. For 2020, 13,126. Dollars. 2019, 11,398. Sale of seeds sold from July to September. 2019, 18. 2020, 22. It would have been more we sold in 2020, but due to the fact that we give out the stimulus packages. What I've noticed for the period of July to September that there was an increase in our culinary herbs. As you could see on the table there, in a total of culinary herbs, we have 120. Constraint that I have experienced in the third quarter, in the third quarter, storage, pricing, farmers are now marketing their own products, produce are not properly sorted. My recommendation in order to solve these problems are offer favorable commission to farmers. Training in sorting and grading need more chill space. My plans for the division for the upcoming months ahead of us are the division will be working closely with the extension in harvest and post-harvest practices along with grading and sorting. We'll also be working with extension in order in order with price control and cost production. We also would like to work closely with the quarantine division as it relates to safe pesticide usage. And we will also like to continue the dialogue with the supermarket, hotels, etc., in order to push our food, our local food, inside of those various outlets. Continue working with the extension for seeds trial and variety section. And I would like to say, I would like to say, continue working with Miss Daniel with the school meat, school meat program in order to push more local food into the schools on Nevis. I thank you. Any question? division compared to marketing now. Right. Yes. We sell produce, they sell fish products, etc. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Leibert, for your presentation. I trust we're, we're, we're all very good still. We're good? I see a lot of persons just also. I'm just making sure that we're still good and we're still paying attention. We have our last presentation now, our last fight. Well, the final presentation, uh, Mr. Floyd Leibert from Forestry Services. Yes, I'm um, good. What is it? Afternoon or morning, Mr. Morning. Good morning to all. Um, let me adopt the protocol that was set by our PS before. I am batting last, but nevertheless, I'll try to put some runs on the board. My name is Floyd Leibert. For you guys who don't know who I am, 
I'm the forestry officer within the Department of Agriculture and also the deputy director at the department. What is forestry? It is important to say to you what is forestry. And forestry is a science and craft of creating, managing, using, conserving, and repairing forests, woodlands, and associate resources for human and environmental benefits. Forestry is practiced in plantations and natural stands. The science of forestry has elements that belongs to the biological, physical, social, political, and managerial sciences. Why is forestry important? There are many reasons why forests are an important feature for the environment and in our daily lives. They are fundamental life forms and provide for the continuity of, worlds, of the world's biodiversity, which is necessary for economic development, diversity of life forms, human livelihoods, and environmental adaptive responses. What is the purpose of the forestry division within the Department of Agriculture? The purpose of the forestry division is to establish and maintain a safe and sustainable tree resource on the island of Nevis, including fruit trees, ornamental, and other plants of economic importance. The forestry division has and still plays an important role in land management, biodiversity conservation, rehabilitation of eroded areas, and help in planning and carrying out other forest-related projects, such as planting of trees, wildlife management, and conserving of our biodiversity. Work done by the forestry department, I mean the forestry division, sorry, maybe I'm thinking ahead, it might become a department, uh, <laughs> over, you know, a few months, um, extending back, because the forestry work is a continuous one. So we would have been involved in the slope stabilization project, the erosion control in the New River area, that's by the Limekin area. Um, assessment of biodiversity project, we were also a part of that one. Wildlife control, um, the monkeys and donkeys. Um, water development enhancement project in, at the New River estate for farmers. We work along with the extension division on irrigation projects on all estates, um, on the 10,000 tree planting initiative, we'd have done some work earlier in the year on this project. We'd have started in schools and some other areas. We would have planted fruit trees and some other trees. Um, this was hindered by the COVID-19 pandemic that came about, and so it's a little behind. But now we'll get it up to speed. I know. Um, a number of schools has come forward and showed interest in having plants on their compounds. We'd have worked also as the forestry unit on a project, on a broiler project um, that you'll hear about a little later. The coconut tree planting um, some years ago in about 20, um, 2008, 2009, we'd have started some a coconut tree planting project in the New River area. This was due to the fact that years before that, we would have experienced some problem with our coconut with the lethal yellowing um, disease, which would have devastated our coconut industry. So the forestry section, the arm of the department, started a replanting program. Um, in the upper New River, close to the mountainside, we started that project. We have some problems in terms of the project, in terms of the, the, the security aspect of the projects. Um, the first tree planting session was to provide nuts yeah. for replanting programs across the island of Nevis. But as the extension would have mentioned earlier, we had some problem with um, Peter Larson, people stealing the nuts even before 
they mature, so I guess they get some young um, jelly water at some point. We would have continued um, in the Lower New River area, just below the Duck Pan area, who, um, for those of you who might know New River. And to date, um, from last year up to this year, recently in the last quarter gone, we would have planted down there some 550 coconut um, palms. And here you have um, two picks, one of the older set. And I must tell you that's a recent pick that was taken um, last week of the older set. Um, we have to do some fencing in that area. So that would be one of our, um, in the fourth quarter, um, work to be done to secure that area so we could have that as a seed bank, so we could continue our coconut tree planting initiative. Also, we ask the general public, if you have nuts that you want to get rid of, we could take them at the department to hatch them out for such a program. We also did work in terms of the biodiversity assessment, where we'd have gone out um, to chop insect, um, but using the, the mist net in the night time, sometime out after 11. And it is important to highlight these because persons in the public may not know the work that the forestry division is doing. And so a forum like this enables us to enlighten the public about some of our work in the forestry section. So we have been out with the park rangers on that project, and in the night we um, chop and release, we'll chop bats, determine whether it's a male or female, measure the wingspan and record those. And there was a consultant um, dealing with that aspect. On the other side, you'll see one of the park ranger and myself, a little fat back then, but um, in traversing uh, to Nevis Peak almost halfway up, every other Sunday, I lost some weight. And that's one of the traps we would have set about halfway up Nevis Peak, a flight interception trap. The insect would fly into that trap. There is a, a, a net type of camouflage material that we'll put there. And under there, we'll have some pans with either um, something like, well, we use some coolant, but you could use like mineral oil. The purpose of that trap was to once the insect flies into the trap and bounce, it would fall into the, the mineral oil and it will remain there. So we'd have done some work in that, in the biodiversity assessment project. Um, in terms of the wildlife control under the forestry section, we are working in terms of controlling monkey, doing our bits and pieces, and also the donkeys. It's not something we want to publicize because we do some culling. And for the period of July to September 2020, we would have culled 2,590 monkeys and 2,179 donkeys. Please, it's not something we want to publicize, but we would have realized that the havoc the cause on farm lands, on farmers, and on vehicles on the road at night um, we'd want to do something. I'm monitoring the effectiveness of the monkey program. We have to develop some monitoring tool. But I must tell you, this pic... Leave your battery going, love boy. Put the card for the computer. Okay, um, I must tell you that this is an old mango tree. And I would have picked mangoes there from since a small boy, three, four years old. And in the past five, six years, I wasn't getting any mangoes at all from the tree. I was surprised last week when I went mangoes ripe on the tree, fell to the ground and so on. This indicates to me that the program, the monkey culling program, has taken some effect on the island of Nevis. I would have spoken to persons around the island and they are saying, you know, they are getting sauce up on the tree, um, you know, that they wouldn't have gotten some years ago. 
So we are doing something, gentlemen, in the back there. Okay, the division, um, having some experience and would have learned some skills from the irrigation project in New River about two, three years ago. We are armed um, with certain expertise. And because of that, we are involved also in the New River Enhancement Project, Water Enhancement Project, along with the ministry. I know Mr. Sargent will feel a little bad, but you know, the ministry back all the finances and so on. But, you know, we did our technical stuff. And we would have seen erected a 20,000 gallon um, water tank that I would, I would have begged hard to Mr. Roger Hanley at the department to give the nearby farmers that tank. And he conceded. And so we have that erected and piped into the system. There was also some repairs done to an old existing water catchment in the nearby area also. So farmers are more pleased now. Um, in terms of the availability of water. There is much work to be done. Um, the forestry unit work is a non-stop working process. It is continuous, so we'll roll on as we see fit. Um, you may look at this slide and say, why poultry in the forestry division section? But I want to tell you, there are some exciting things to come. And this is one of them. The forestry section would have been involved and heavily involved in helping to put together um, the poultry um, industry on the island. We'd have gotten a proposal. We'd have um, put into it, you know. And this came out of the COVID-19. When we look at the hardship that farmers were facing in getting birds um, out of Barbados, and the hardship of slaughtering birds at the end of six weeks, we at the ministry and department decided we want to do something in agriculture which is big, different, and beneficial. So we looked at the data, we looked at the issues facing the industry. We would have done our research, we would have done some letters of intent on both islands, and we would have met with the supermarket uh, managers, owners, grill operators, wholesalers, and so on, to feed um, that sort of information into this uh, proposal. I think it's a timely one, and I think it's one that would reap great benefit. These two um, tables show the input data in doing the research of chicken into our federation. In sync it's you would have seen here, over the five years period from 2015 to 2019, we would have had 62 million four hundred and eighty-eight thousand four dollars and twenty-seven cents in terms of dollars of imported chicken into Sinkits, while Little Nevis would have had 12 million one hundred and ninety-nine thousand six hundred and eighty-four dollars and twenty-two cents in imported chicken. So in a combination of both islands, we would have realized, Steve, I think that, right. we would have realized that over, over, uh, let's put it in, we just continue, create it up, create it up, I'll, I'll continue. Um, we would have, move that, that dead. <laughs> <laughs> we would have realized, <laughs> Presentation. That in combination of both islands, we had over seventy-four million dollars in imported um, chicken into the federation, and you've seen over thirty-four million pounds of chicken. And we decided we have to do something. Yes, um, some of the benefits of, of this um, broiler project would be job creation, it would be encouragement of entrepreneurship, and reduce input. And that is, that's something we have to work on. We have to be self-sufficient. Um, we are not saying that we'll get it at one go, but we are saying that if we could reduce it slowly and surely, we'll make some inroads into, into that. 
So some of maybe you may come farm owners, you may come farm attendants, you know, operation assistant when it come to the facility. Um, and this would increase our food security. Collaborators, um, ministries, departments of agriculture, both and Sinkits and Nevis, the Abattoir Division, the Minister of Agriculture, who is very enthusiastic about this project, and we are behind him on getting this project done. Um, so all the collaborative effort will be putting together a broiler slaughtering facility. Okay, I want to tell you about um, Keats Bay, one of our farm. We are working to create an agro-tourism site at Keats Bay. Work would have started, and I know the PS a little on my case, but for a good reason. So we would have done some power washing, and then we'll secure some paint to do some painting. Um, we have a deadline to meet, so we are working hard and surely to meet um, those deadlines. We'll be creating such thing as a tea garden and encourage tourists to visit the site, get the fruit, a whole package um, at a minimum cost. Um, we'll be calling also on the agro-processing division to provide um, little samples and so on. We're working along with the Ministry of Tourism and the Ministry, Mr. Sergeant, sir. Okay, we're going forward for the forestry um, division. Establish up your stands of fruit trees, such as nutmegs. You might go, have to go higher up, maybe somewhere in the valley area, in the river. Avocado, sour sap, custard apple, limes, shaddock, that we, we deem is going extinct. We would have found some shaddock in the main grounds area in a gut, and we want to propagate those. Because years ago, every yard, I think, had shadow and tangerine planted um, in it. We want to develop also a forestry management plan for the forestry unit. Because without a plan, you'll be going nowhere, and you are doomed. Establishment of a plant nursery. We do have a propagation nursery um, in Prospect. But we realize that the forestry section in its programs compete with the general public for the same set of plants to be planted out for a program. So we'll be doing a nursery and do specific plants like the sea grape for coastal erosion projects and other projects and so on. Continue to develop, continue development of the water resource um, for farmers. Reinstate the spray program we would have realized in working along with um, the quarantine section and speaking with Mr. Bart. There's a lot to be done in terms of plant protection. A lot of scales, insects, and plants, a lot of different things. So we'll be reinstating that program we had some time ago in the next um, quarter to assist persons, whether it be farmers or backyard owners, to have some relief in terms of protecting their plants. We'll continue with the 10,000 um, tree planting initiative that I told you earlier. We'd have had some stalls because of COVID, but we'll continue in the upcoming quarter to do some work in that regard. And I would have spoke about the enhancement of the Kidsby area to become an agro-tourism site. Constraint, we do have constraint and tardiness and irregular attendance of workers. That um, has caused backlog in terms of our work, and we'll continue to work and devise you know, plans to deal with that as we would have started already. Some plans persons don't like, but we have to do what we have to do to ensure that the forestry section is up and running properly. Lack of necessary equipment to aid in the fruit tree protection program, high powered speed, because we would have realized that after a tree passed a certain height, um, the mist blower that we have cannot deliver the chemical to such heights. So we'll be looking into getting a high power spray that could deliver that insecticide, fungicide, whatever the case may be, 
to that plant. And I would have mentioned already, lack of planting material due to the, um, for the program, due to the same source um, for the public and also our program. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's for us to this division in the next show. Any questions, queries? Are the service of assisting their planting of the trees or the spacing that these trees need? Also, in terms of felling, felling, the felling of trees, do you assist in that instance? Um, first question, do you assist farmers in establishing plots? Um, that's something we are passionate about. Um, However, we, in terms of the actual planting, we, we do the layout for you and in terms of the space and tell you, you know, the distance apart and so on. But in terms of the actual um, physical planting, it would be challenging because we are a stretch to some extent. If we could assist, we would. Um, in terms of felling, yes, we could assist um, persons. And I, I'm happy you brought up that point because um, we will now have to look at the forestry laws and regulations um, to beef it up because we have realized that persons fell trees all manner how close to God, close to waterways, and that in turn leads to some erosion problem. But we could work with, with farmers if they need some assistance and I have to put on my boots, no problem. I'll show you, maybe plant the first five for you and show you how it's done and then you could continue on that. Any more questions? Okay. If, oh. Sure. Yeah. Um, Project, yeah. I Yes. They are dwindling because the, the suppliers are now selling all the photos. And this is a fact. Hey, look, we can't meet your order because I have to send chicken to China. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to continue. Um, maybe you can get from some of those smaller plants. Mm -hmm. See how they could help you. And that is not good enough. That is true. We really need to move this plant forward. Yes. Okay, um, before I go, um, as you mentioned about the um, Dr. Challenger mentioned about the um, thing, I wanted you know, just enlighten you how far we are. We would have gotten some quotes in terms of the um, necessary equipment for the, the, the plant. We would have um, gotten a, a layout in terms of how the equipment should be laid out. And now our architect is working on the plans for that. We'd have identified a site already and so on. So we're forging ahead and we have good backing from the PS in St. Kitts, from the PS in Nevis, from the minister. He's hearing blows and that. And, you know, we'll work towards delivering. Uh, such a project. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that's the end of our formal presentations. I will take this opportunity to invite the Director of, of Agriculture, Mr. Randy Elliott, to give um, a two-minute two wrap-up. Very, very brief, and I stress very, please. <laughs> Good morning, one and all. And again, I would like to, oh, good afternoon, sorry. I would like to welcome all who are here today to stay, to be in tune in terms of what's going on within the agriculture sector here in Nevis. Sitting down 
is a lot different from just reading the reports when they come to my desk and sitting down and listening gave a different view of, of the department. I am very proud of my staff that presented here today and I do think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> some of which, and I'm sure you may not be able to tell, but some of which presented here for the very first time in their life. So, I, be, I, I, so I, I do believe that those few deserve a round of applause. They will know who they are. The question has always been asked um, from time to time. The minister would ask, how is agriculture in Nevis? The PS of HR would ask, how is agriculture in Nevis? And what you saw this morning, I believe that that should be able to answer your questions. While we are pushing or forging ahead, there are still challenges, there are still difficulties, and I would not go through all of them because my staff would have highlighted them here this morning. Going forward, we as a department now need to understand, and not, not just the presenters here, but including the staff under the management, that there's a task ahead, and we have to work a lot harder to been able to be a little more sufficient in terms of feeding ourselves. One of the things that came out, and including looking at my data and speaking to my chief financer, is that during COVID would have brought out that the budget that is allocated to agriculture cannot support the sector. And it should also be known that if, because the sector is a giant, if the sector is able to grow, there must be made for more inputs. And you would have heard it from each section. The lack of equipment, the lack of raw materials, those are just some of the top of the challenges that we face. We continue to ask the public to support the sector. We, complete, we continue to ask the public to support the farmers in Nevis because we realize that people are now yearning for local. And we as a department and our farmers, we have to be able to meet that demand for the general public. Behind me here is just a brief synopsis of what we're going to do for World Food Day. And it's a week of activities that we would have put together for this year World Food Day as we celebrate under the theme, grow, nourish, sustain, together our actions are our future. And this year, the, the outline is there. And we're asking the general public to come and support. The abattoir will be there for, so for those who are looking for those 23 different processed products. Those products will be there. Those who normally rush for the mutton, those will be there. Those who are looking for stuff from agro-processing, they will be there. The farmers will be there. And this morning, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to the minister, Minister Jeffers, because he would have stood here about four years ago. And within his speech, he indicated that he would like the sector to facilitate more in terms of the schools. And if you realize coming out of the presentations, even from agro processing, marketing, the schools are now on board. So Mr. Minister, we are listening. The department is listening, and we're trying our utmost best to ensure that we do what we're tasked to do. Thank you.
our, our videography, um, my videographic former colleague is telling me that his card is out of space, so he really can't tape anything. <laughs> so um, I'd, I'd like to invite a few persons. Um, I think we're allowed to take about four or five comments. Um, I, I would first yield to, to Minister Jeffers. Um, yeah, we could take about four or five comments before we, we wrap up. Yes. Well, I won't be a true politician. I won't speak for too long. Quickly, I just want to commend all of the presenters who would have presented uh, today. As a matter of fact, um, I sat there and I myself, I can safely say I was not certain as to what was going on in every aspect. But at least the information garnered here today have given me a clear vision and a clear view as to what is taking place in agriculture in Nevis. It is not for me, as the policy, uh, part of the policy making body, to know exactly what is happening. I believe once policies are shaped and formed, then the persons who are charged with that responsibility to uh, execute, then there is where the test is and there is where the uh, testimony of the effort of the department is. And I want to say that everyone would have presented here this morning some glowing reports. And I hope they're not made up. Oh, you see, you laugh. So they're not made up. These are factual numbers. These are factual numbers, and, and that is why I want to commend everyone, and I want to thank you for the effort. Now, uh, everyone would have indicated that they, uh, their challenge is ahead, of course, yes. But I said before when I was here earlier that uh, now that we have some downtime, so to speak, it gives us a chance to regroup, reassess, and reinvigorate our efforts and so forth to ensure that once we come out on the other side of all this, and the demand is there for local products, the demand is there for what we're producing here on the island of Nevis, that we're able in some uh, measure to meet those demands. And I do believe that when the hotels are open, I, I, I am almost certain that based on what we are seeing right now, that the hotels will be running to us, not only us, but to the, the, the farmers here on the island of Nevis. And no one mentioned the steps we are taking at the department in terms of uh, the construction of that storage and marketing facility. That is key to what we intend to do here moving forward in terms of ensuring that farmers are bringing their produce. I am saying to farmers from this rostrum that your job is to grow crops. Our job is to market and sell and do whatever is necessary to get the goods and uh, produce to where they should get to. So we are building that facility and that is, it will be key to the future of uh, agriculture here on the island of Nevis. But let me say also a footnote that once we start to take on these responsibilities, we do not expect farmers to go um, counter to what we're doing in terms of going around the process. We want it to be organized in the sense that you, you do your farming, we take on the burden of marketing and, and distributing, and I believe the system can work. And all of us, whatever little we make, over time and the incremental value of our effort will be there. So I want farmers to buy into that. And this is a start of, this reporting session is a start to give us an idea as to where we are and where we need to head to. Uh, I said I was going to be brief, so that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. And I want to thank you for coming as well. I certainly appreciate the, the turnout today. It is certainly, uh, it certainly warms my heart to see so many of you here. And we're going to make sure that we continue this. And P.S. Collins, get ready. We're coming down to St. Kitts to undertake such a venture as well. Because as we go, you must go. And as we both go together, I believe the Federation will be in good standing. And, and our efforts will be there to show in the end. So we'll work together to make sure that happens. Thank you. I did say four or five. Mr. Marchant, sure. Let me congratulate. <laughs> Let me congratulate uh, all the presenters for this morning. Uh, the director said they were all superb. I remember yesterday when I was walking with my good friend here. She was all worried. But you did a splendid job this morning. <laughs> now, one of the things I told the staff was that you have had people who have gone before, and we need 
to continue to have good people. I remember going to Washington, speaking to Dr. Keatley Jones. And Dr. Keatley Jones told me, Mr. Martin, my experience at the department was what put me here. Dr. Oscar Leibert at Gainfield University, he told me the same thing too. So we are off to a good start. Thank you very much. Allow me also to add my own brief remarks because our boat leaves at 12.30 um, and express words of commendation to the entire team. Um, not just those who presented, but those who supported them by providing the information and by the work that you're doing. I want to encourage you because it is the way forward for our federation and we are committed to this. We are enhancing agriculture and uh, the, the greater excitement came at the, the, the close of the presentation when the deputy director would have alluded to a very positive and forward thinking project that is the boiler project. We will make it a reality. We will ensure that in other areas we decrease our import and allow our people to get in on the profits that are going outside and ensure food safety, food security, a more enhanced sector, and we can do it together. So I want to commend you. We will be doing a similar exercise because it's about accountability. The minister did say, well, I hope you're not making up anything. And I will know that you're not by the excitement that we are seeing. And the reality is that we are in it together. And I want all of us to see the part that we play, the farmers, the administrators, the technical experts in agriculture, whatever area you are, you are in, that we are in it together and we are holding each other's hand. Until we get there, we see the other communities out there doing this and I need to stop. So thank you very much <laughs> and may we continue going forward. I have to ask if anyone else wants to make any other comments. If not, thank you very much. Um, it, has, <laughs> it has certainly been an enlightening day. And I, I too want to add my congratulations to the various presenters and to the department overall for all they've been doing in terms of food and nutrition security on the island of Nevis. And we have, we have some work to do and we ha we've had some achievements. So while we, we celebrate, we, we will not rest on our laurels, and we have to take the necessary steps to ensure we have good food and nutrition security. Uh, I want to thank especially our colleagues from St. Kitts who journeyed over. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, you've been giving us your support and for a long time, and we will, as, as Minister <laughs> said, we will reciprocate the support. So once again, thank you very much for your support. And have a good afternoon. We do well. One more, one, one housekeeping matter. We do have some snacks at the back. I, I most of them are local, so do party. Yeah. <laughs>